We're continuing on with this topic of operability. It's a topic I introduced to you last time on Friday, just prior to Thanksgiving. So it's been a while. Let's just do a quick recap of some of that discussion we had yesterday on Friday and then move forward from that. Just a quick announcement then um, for the people that have their tutorial tomorrow, Thursday. There is a venue change just for tomorrow's tutorial because JHE 342 is being used for the Engineering Olympics. So we've been asked to move temporarily just for tomorrow's Thursday tutorial. Friday is still in the regular spot. Um, so it's on the website. I forget the, the room number. Um, the other thing is on Friday's class is uh, a guest lecture by Dr. Tom Marlin. Uh, Dr. Marlin uh, used to teach this course for many years with Dr. Woods and then on his own. And he will be um, coming to give a lecture on a chapter from a textbook that he's just completed on reliability engineering. So he's probably a good expert on that topic and uh, will be giving Friday's lecture and then uh, perhaps on Monday the week after. So the topic of reliability follows on from the one that we're looking at in today's class and let's just look at why we're studying this. We had said that on Friday's class when we're looking at the idea of operability, another way that we can use that term is robustness. And we had looked at a variety of ways in which processes don't behave as we expect. The whole point from Friday's class is that if you choose to design a process at a single nominal point, so you set one base case with a given feed and you select your technology, you design your flow sheet, you simulate it, you design that equipment and then build it, that the two, three years that happen in between will mean that by the time you construct and start up your plant, it will not actually operate as you expect and may not even operate at all. Okay, and this is a little bit surprising for people in this course because it essentially says that everything you've learned up to now in engineering, we're basically saying doesn't work if you build it as is, right? So we, this whole idea of designing for a given single operating point, which is pretty much what every assignment and every test and exam has told you to do is you design for a given flow rate, for a given concentration, for a given temperature. We're saying essentially that that never happens in practice. And if you do that, your equipment will not be useful. It will not be operable. And that's why we call this topic operability. So how do we resolve this, this problem? Well, we'll look at that in today's class at a first start in doing so. But what I wanted to quickly recap is some of the reasons I said in Friday's class why we have this problem. And the, re the reasons pretty much came down, um, I guess, to five areas. If I just write some short bullet points here off to the side, the first reason is deliberate change. Okay, that would be one way of summarizing the reasons for these problems, deliberate change. And that's illustrated here in this particular slide. So even though I didn't have these slides up on Friday, we discussed the content of them. So change that are, are deliberately introduced where perhaps you might decide to reduce the production rate in your plant to match the, the demand in the market. Right? If you cannot produce, uh, sorry, if you cannot sell 100,000 tons per year of your product because there's no market for it, you need to scale back. And how do you move your process down? That's a deliberate operation, a deliberate change that you introduce. Another deliberate change, um, and this is very typical that you'll see, especially in 4W, is a plant is never designed to produce one product. Right, if you go look at some of the, the really interesting plants where there's the most engineering challenges are the plants that produce multiple products on the same equipment. That's a tremendous task you're asking to do, right? Because if you go back to this idea right at the top here, you set your goal and specification and you design one set of equipment. Now we're essentially doing this design process many times. So food production companies, pharmaceuticals, drugs, manufacturing, this is a common occurrence where you're using the same reactor to produce maybe 10, 20, and I've seen companies produce up to 200 
different variety of SKUs or unique products on their processes. So how do we transition between one product to the next? How do you do that quickly? How do you even just run the set points to produce those multiple products? Okay, and then here, the third item, a deliberate change. This would be common, especially in the petroleum industry, where you have to accept a variety of feedstocks. Mining industry is the same. Oil sands. Those industries where you're taking a product out of the ground and you move to a different location from one month to the next, you're processing a different feed. The feed from one location from the earth is very different to the feed from a different location. So when we're designing our process, right up here in the very beginning, set the goal and the design specifications. You can be sure that those companies have done multiple tests, taking samples of soil and minerals or oil sands, as the case may be, to test that that equipment that they're designing can work on a variety of sources of raw material. Petroleum industry, that's very common as well. So that's the first topic, deliberate change. The second one here is obviously disturbances, as written up here. Disturbances you can visualize as unintended changes, but this, I will also clarify, these are unintended changes, but this is normal variation. A disturbance is a normal part of everyday operation in a plant. So for example, the temperature outside is fluctuating up and down your cooling water temperature is fluctuating up and down. In the winter, you can get a lower cooling water inlet temperature. In the summertime, that cooling water inlet temperature is quite a bit higher. Okay, so you can't control for it, you can't adjust for it, you simply accept that this variability exists. But what this whole topic, I guess, can be summarized down is that abnormal is normal, or variation is normal. So a single base case, a single number that you're designing your plant for is not normal. We're always designing for a variety of conditions. Okay, fouling is another disturbance that occurs. You cannot control for it. Heat exchanger fouling, catalyst deactivation, these just happen, but they're normal occurrences. The third one is, um, here uses a different title, mismatch in design models. I'll just simply call that model error. Okay, that one can be summarized fairly succinctly by simply recognizing that the tools that you simulate your plant with, Aspen, Hysis, maybe it's a crude Excel spreadsheet where you've got reaction coefficients in it, those are not perfect models. There's always error. Okay, for those of you that are going to take the 4C3 statistics course with me next term, that theme will come up regularly. All models are wrong, okay, is one of the famous quotes that are out there. All models are wrong. Aspen is wrong. The vapor-liquid equilibrium coefficients, the Peng-Robinson equation, they're wrong. They're useful. They give you good enough predictions, but they're not 100% accurate, okay? And so when you go and plan and simulate your flow sheet using those simulators, you have to expect that afterwards there's going to be some mismatch or what we call model error. Okay, if you're going to rely on those models and expect your plant to operate exactly as those models tell you, you're going to be disappointed. The fourth one here is equipment malfunction and this one is abnormal operation. So equipment breaks. This is abnormal, you don't expect this to happen. We would prefer it never to happen, but it does. But we have to plan our processes and our flow sheets for this to happen, for this to occur, right? This would be the equivalent of you getting in an aircraft and expecting all four jet engines to always work all the time. And if all four engines work, everything goes fine. But should one break, you don't want that aircraft to go down. Right? The aircraft must still be capable of operating on the remaining three or the remaining two engines. It's the same thing in our chemical processes. You can't have a single pump, a single heat exchanger, or a single valve that brings the entire plant down for you. Okay? You can't go into a forced shutdown 
due to one piece of equipment failing. So this is what Dr. Marlin is going to talk about on Friday. How do we quantify that and how do we um, set up our flow sheets to prevent that from happening? And then the fifth area that we mentioned last Friday um, is human error. Okay, so remember I had given you that idea. I would asked you in the class, how many decisions do you make every minute of every day? How many decisions does an operator make every day? What percentage of those decisions are successful versus unsuccessful? And we had come to the conclusion that human error will occur. An operator is not always going to make the right decision all the time. But again, you can't allow a process to be brought down because of one bad decision. Okay, so you, we will see and learn how we engineer and improve our process flow sheets to prevent this from happening. Okay, so that's essentially a summary of, of Friday's lecture, breaking down the causes for this topic due to those five reasons. So what I'll do then is, at this moment, I'm going to switch to the new set of slides I posted. So that was the overview. You'll you notice in this PDF um, that I post over the next two weeks that there's a lot of extra slides I don't cover. And there's, there's a reason for that. It's because though those are there for information, for enrichment. I expect that you will read through those at some point in your career and maybe even this semester. But they're there for, um, for extra background information. So there's a whole lot of pages there which we won't cover. So let's move on to the next topic then, which is operating window. And at this point, I'm going to switch to mostly the board for the rest of the class. And I'm going to ask you to perhaps think of operating window in the following way. So if you don't have the notes, it's not too serious because we'll, um, we'll cover a lot of it on the board. But perhaps think of the operating window as follows. Okay, so we're comfortable with the fact that our body has a finite range over which we can comfortably and safely operate our body. Okay? By that I mean if we looked at perhaps a plot of two variables, and I've chosen two fairly arbitrary variables here, but you could see how this could change to different variables. The first one is your calorie intake. Okay? How many calories do you take in every day? 2,500, what's the average requirement? 2,000 for females, 2,500 for males, typical numbers, right? If you're doing extreme sports and heavy exercise, you may jump that up to three, 4,000 calories a day. If you're starving, um, there's all sorts of websites that you can look at what gives a minimum bound for calorie intake, and a typical number is about 800 to 1,000 before you start doing serious damage to your body. Okay, so when we're looking at this idea of operating window, that's exactly what we're considering here, is what is the range through which you can push your equipment? Okay, I'm giving you an example of your body as a piece of equipment, and we're going to move to a different actual chemical process equipment shortly. But this is a good, good starting point. So your calorie intake, maybe an extreme low of 8,000, and let's just choose an upper bound of 3,000 but you could conceivably go beyond that as a calorie intake. And if on the vertical axis I choose a second variable, I'm going to choose ambient temperature. Okay, so this is a disturbance. This is not something that you can necessarily affect, but what I'm saying is let's take a look at what happens to the human body on a long-term basis at steady state at various ambient temperatures. So what's a, what would be a lower bound and an upper bound? 40 degrees. 
40 degrees C, upper bound. What would be a lower bound? Let's assume that you're, you're wearing clothes, right? So there's no, right? Ambient temperature that you can expose your body for, let's take 10, 20 hours, a long period of time. We're looking at an operating window. Okay, so let's pick five. Now, is the operating window for this, think about this carefully, is the operating window for your body under these conditions, can you operate at all points within that square or rectangle at steady state? So remember, steady state says you're, you're not a... You're, you're, there's no accumulation term, right? So accumulation means like you're, you're not getting any skinnier or any fatter. You're not doing damage to your equipment, right? The same way in a chemical process, you don't want to be operating permanently at a position where you're causing damage to the equipment. So here, what, what might that operating window look like? Sean? So we would need to curve away at low temperatures, low calories. We're saying there's some sort of region here where you probably can't operate at. Okay? So maybe something like this. This region is unachievable from a steady state regular operating point of view. Okay? And maybe this region curves back like this as well. Right? At, at high temperatures, again, you need a sort of increase in calorie level. Okay. Can you operate over here in this region in a sustainable way? Low temperatures, high calorie intake. Likely, right? And then high calorie intake, high temperatures. Yeah, it seems, it seems okay. You, I mean, if we're thinking steady state, though, you probably don't want to get too overweight by operating at that point, but it's, it's, it's possible for some period of time, okay? So you've got an operating window concept here now for the human body. Ambient temperature, that is a disturbance, okay? And calorie intake is a controlled variable. Now let's take a look at, um, uh, maybe before we move on, I'd maybe ask you to consider changing these axes up to something like heart rate. Okay, so consider that as, as one of the, as changing one of the variables up. Consider maybe another variable, not ambient temperature, but your body temperature. Okay, so think of those examples in your own time. Um, to switch out the X and Y axes. Now let's move to a chemical process. And we're going to choose a flash drum here. Now I'd asked you in a prior assignment to consider flash drums. And so we know that a flash vessel is a cylindrical vessel with two streams leaving. We've got a vapor stream leaving and we have a liquid stream leaving. And because it's a liquid stream, we need to pump it as it leaves. Okay. And a flash vessel has the goal of separating liquid from vapor. That's one of the reasons why we use a flash vessel. So my vapor stream leaves in the overhead. My liquid stream sort of builds up here in the vessel. But a flash vessel also, the driving force in a flash vessel is we, we flare out this feed. And we remember from thermodynamics when we have a pressure change happening, we get some change in the system's entropy. 
we get our vapor liquid equilibrium changing and what's leaving overhead in the vapor has a different composition to what's leaving out in the liquid. Okay, and the reason why a flash vessel is sized to have a certain height is because what we're sending over here is liquid plus vapor coming in and we get particles of liquid suspended in here and we need to give them enough time for those liquid particles to drop out. Right? And we need to give enough time for my vapor particles to find their way through and move up to the overhead. Okay? Flash is very easy to understand from that point of view, that you need a drum. Because if that wasn't the case, all we could do is put a T over there. Right? A T would be a very effective vapor liquid separator because the vapor would go up, the liquid would go down. But why don't we do that in practice? Well, it's because this separation doesn't happen instantaneously. We need a drum to provide some time. There's some residence time in there for the droplets to settle down and the vapor to go up. Okay? And we also need some equilibrium to occur, the equilibrium settling over there. So the vapor has a different composition leaving from the liquid composition. Now, the moment we have a pump in engineering processes, you, the last thing you want to have happen in many pumps is for that pump to run dry. Right? That's, we know that from experience, that that's not a good thing to have happen. And so what we will do then is, and this is where the process control kicks in quite significantly in this course. 3P is a large, important prerequisite for this course. We'll have level control. So we have a level sensor over there and let's perhaps draw this a little bit more carefully and more accurately. Put the level sensor in over there and we feed the level sensor as an input to a control loop that adjusts the valve over here. So we pump more liquid out if we need to drop that liquid level and we close that valve back if we want to raise the liquid level up. And that's the way we control the liquid level in that flash drum and prevent the pump from running dry. Okay. Now flash also requires very careful input to keep this incoming stream at the right temperature. If that inlet stream is too hot, the liquid portion traveling in the pipe disappears and Essentially, if we feed the stream in too warm, we're basically feeding in vapor over there, right? And most of our vapor then will simply end up going out the top. We will have no liquid and nothing to feed our downstream operation with, right? So this liquid stream leaving over here always goes to another unit, right? A flash vessel is not your last vessel in a flow sheet. It goes downstream and feeds liquid to something following it, and the vapor goes to one of the next systems that we have. So control of this incoming temperature is important. Okay, we can't just send vapor through here because then we'll have no liquid and conversely the temperature can't be too low because then I'll be sending pure liquid down simply out the bottom and have no vapor to go out the top. Okay. And this control loop it does a really critical job because if the control loop isn't there and you're filling this drum up with liquid, you're going to be sending liquid into your vapor stream and you can be pretty sure the reason for that flash vessel is critical. Downstream from that vapor line is probably a unit that only expects vapor. So the last thing you want to be doing is sending liquid down there. So standard petroleum um, flow sheet unit, the flash drum, downstream of the vapor line will be reactors and other devices that only expect vapor and so you don't want to send liquid through that line and so careful control in this loop is important. Okay, so there's a lot here about flash drums that's maybe non-obvious. But now let's take a look and see how we can apply this to an operating window. And I'm going to get you to think about this a bit more. So what we'll do then, we've said that flow rate is important. We can't overflow, we can't send too high flow rates through here, and we can't send too low flow rates, we also can't send too high a temperature, and we can't also send too low a temperature. 
So you're starting to see now what your operating window looks like, or at least what are the two variables in your operating window, flow and temperature. So let's step back then and complete this flow sheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to heat that stream coming in with a heat exchanger. And I'm going to use steam. So I'm going to send steam up there. And in your notes, this is called valve. There's a valve over there. And the steam, we measure the flow rate. Dr. Marlin has called it F3. Okay, And there's another heat exchanger. And we're using another valve and another flow that we're measuring there. We call that F2. So two valves controlling the heat exchange. And coming in then, we have two measures, T1 and F1. So I've worked a little bit backwards, but I've assembled that flow sheet that's essentially there in your notes for you. Now let's take a look at the operating window for it. No, it can be any two variables. I just tap, happen to use those two. In this case, we're going to use two variables again. I'm going to use on the vertical axis, I uh, just want to make sure it's consistent with the notes. I'm going to use T1. So T1 is my inlet temperature. And I'm going to use F1, which is my inlet flow. And in this case, both of those are disturbances. My inlet flow comes from some upstream unit. And my inlet temperature comes from what, whatever's coming from upstream. Okay. And because they're disturbances, they're fluctuating up and down. Temperature is moving up and down, T1, F1 is fluctuating up and down. So both of those are disturbances. But I've already said that for a flash drum to operate successfully, we have to have a fairly good bound on what that liquid vapor flow rate is coming in, as well as that temperature of that inlet stream, to make sure that it's not primarily vapor and make sure it's not primarily liquid. So I'm going to just draw one of the bounds in the operating window, and I'm going to ask you to think about it and interpret it. This, this takes a little while. It seems a little bit counterintuitive. But there's this bound over here, this vertical line in the nodes. And I'm going to ask you to tell what happens when I move from this point to this point. What's changing in the system? So I believe in the notes, this is minus 5 degrees Celsius. And up here is 60 Celsius. And I'm going to ask you to tell me, how do I go? What do I change in my process to go from point A to point B? What's changing? as you go from point A to point B, and why that, that bound exists. So it's not obvious. Take two, three minutes, discuss it with the person next to you, and think through this flow sheet.
separation it leaves temperature bounds. It's just it will separate. It or will be vapor. it will give the desired separation. Oh, okay. It will give the desired separation, right? Same like with the human body. You don't want to be, it's not the efficacy of your human body. It's like you want to still be operating in a comfortable, sustainable, healthy manner. Okay, let's start perhaps with the easy of the two questions. Why does that bound exist? So this is maybe 60, I think in the notes it's 60, whatever the units of flow are. Why is there a lower bound? Why can't we go to lower flows? Risk of running the pump dry. We, we need to supply the vapor line and the liquid line with enough material for the downstream operation. So 60 is determined as a minimum flow below which you can't supply those, those needs anymore. Okay. So that's why we're at 60. How to move from A to B? What happens at A? And how do we get to B? Any suggestions there? Okay, so adjust F2, F3, that's, that's, that's correct. Um, but notice the reason for it, though. Where's T1 measured? Ahead, okay. So at A, what, what is the position of F2, or how much is F2 and F3 reading? What would be the valve positions? Let's call these V2 and V3. What would be the valve positions for V2 and V3 when you're at point A? They're in the, in the, in the drawing and the flow sheet there with you. But yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, you can assume that they're there. What happens at point A? How do we... What at point A we're saying our feed inlet temperature is minus five degrees C. What would be the valve position V two and V three so that you can operate at point A? Remember, this is the key part. This is the key insight, and why I want you to answer these questions to yourselves. The operating window tells us that you're able to successfully operate in this window. So you've got the no the notes in front of you. You can see that the window looks something like that. Okay, so that's the solution. What we're saying is that you're able to successfully operate at that extreme point. What do you do to your process to get that operation there? Okay, F2, V2 and V3 are more open, fully open. Okay, that's why this is an extreme on the operating window, right? You can't operate beyond this point because at this point, F2 and F3 are fully open. That's right. T1 is before. Okay, so T1 is minus 5 degrees Celsius. It's a really cold inlet stream. So we're saying you're able to successfully operate this process with this disturbance of T1 at minus 5 degrees Celsius. Remember, you don't control T1. T1 is whatever you get from upstream. So at minus 5 degrees Celsius, to counteract the disturbance, feedback control, to get that counteraction, 
we need to open V2, open V3 fully to heat it up to the required temperature for successful flash. Okay. So the operating window, and this is the critical insight, the operating window is a region where you can successfully operate your process. No different to the operating window I started the class off with for your human body. Right? The operating window for your human body is a region where you can successfully operate your body at variety of calorie intakes and ambient temperatures without causing damage to your body. What if they can fully open where it starts to like slope up where we just move out of the operating window because that slow flows where we need those valves fully open to heat the low flow situation from the end? Okay, so what we're saying is this is steady state. So think steady state conditions, right? So at a, at a very low flow coming in that's very cold, you need to provide this heat to get it up to the temperature so that you can successfully flash it, right? If you didn't provide that heat there, you'd have a primarily liquid stream and, and very little vapor and not able to, to flash it. So I, I think I get what you mean. So yeah. it means that wouldn't it be maximum open at A but at the highest, like uh, at the highest flow rate, F1? Okay. Like okay, I see. Okay, I see. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that line in a minute. So I see where you're going. Okay, good point. Okay, so let's, uh, let's come up this direction. We'll work clockwise. So to go from A to B, at the point B, where are those valves V2 and V3 then? Fully closed, okay? Because your inlet stream is supplying the necessary energy to get you to where you can flash and operate successfully, okay? Now let's move along this, this horizontal line. So we're increasing the flow from 60, and I think the notes show this goes to 180 units of flow. So whatever that, uh, those units are, what we're essentially saying is that that flow comes in and we're able to operate along that line. All the flows, no matter what amount they're coming in, by, we will be able to successfully take a stream that's 60 degrees Celsius. Why can't we operate higher than that? It's primarily vapor, right, from, from before. Okay, what stops us to go from outside this bound? So in other words, how do we know that's the, the maximum we can go? Sorry? You can't heat, so at this point your valves are, are fully shut, so you're not providing any heating. So what stops me from going beyond there? Capacity of the downstream units, right? So the flash drum may not be able to accept all that capacity and process it all. The pump, the vapor lines, the downstream demands from the system. Sorry, I was just going to say that the rest of the time. Right. So there's, there could be a variety of reasons why that's the upper bound. It's what might be downstream, we can't process at a higher rate than 180, okay? By doing this, you're also starting to see how you might develop this operating window, right? We're going, we're working backwards. I'm showing you the operating window and, and figuring out how its bounds are determined, but how would you do this in practice is through flow sheet simulation if the plant isn't built yet. If the plant has been built and you're trying to do this after the fact, you could do this by experimentation if you got permission to do so. But generally, we will we'll develop these operating windows through simulation tools. Okay. So now we come down here. At high flows, we're moving in this direction. The valves V2, V3 are going which way? Opening, okay, so to move down here, valves V2 and V3 need to open up because we're saying we've got high flows coming in and our temperature's slowly decreasing, so my inlet temperature is, is dropping. To counteract that and still operate here at the same successful inlet, I need to open V2 and V3. Now, perhaps let me look at this region that's been cut off, this triangular region and ask why can we not operate successfully in there? 
Why is that part cut off in your notes? Matt? Okay. We can't get the required temperature. Specifically, why can't we re achieve that desired temperature? Uh, Sean? Probably because the amount of sodium flow keeps changing. The temperature is that isn't enough to warm the amount of sodium above the flow to the ground. Okay. We, that's right. So at this high flow rate, and these valves that we said V2 and V3 are fully open, we can't provide the heat input required to get to that temperature over here, right? So at very high flows, you've got a lot of energy moving through your system. A lot of you're transferring the maximum heat from stream two and stream three. That region is cut off because you're unable to achieve that energy transfer required. Okay. So yeah, pre your valves are fully open at that at that corner. You can't, can't do anything. In fact, your valves are fully open along that diagonal edge over there. Because it says, well, if your valves are fully open, I can scale back my flow and still get desired in the temperature. Why doesn't that diagonal continue on all the way to the, to the other vertical one? Okay, so I, uh, like further down? Yeah. Okay, I guess it's the same reason why do we have this lower bound here? Okay, okay so say, say, same question, just a different way of asking it. What's that lower bound there for? Why can't I process feeds of minus 8 degrees Celsius, minus 10? OK. It could be a physical requirement on that material in the pipe, and it's freezing. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. Right? Okay, so it's the f physical property related. Okay, maybe let me put it this way is, um, so when I, I, don't worry about this. This is, this is the whole topic is, is, it's tough to frame these questions, right? So, and that's why I'm happy, this is very interactive, these discussions, and why I said in Friday's class, the best seats are here at the front, because that's where the detail is, and um, I can get some feedback from you and see where your understanding and misunderstandings are. So, coming further down here, uh, perhaps what I should have said earlier is that, the valves are not 100% open here at point A. Okay, they could be something like 40, 50% open. So along this diagonal, the valves are 100% open. As your flow decreases, your valves start to shut and shut and shut because you don't need to provide so much energy to a really cold stream. Okay. Yeah, Mick. So, like to go further? It's a little further than the top, like some of that, some of that, yeah. yeah, it could be, but it might be that below minus five degrees Celsius, we can't, the, the material doesn't flow in the pipe, for example, right? So, there could be a physical uh, property constraint there on that. Okay. Okay, so operating windows, and, and from this discussion, I'm hoping you start to see are actually. They're a critical part of our understanding of a process. What you'll find is in practice, operators and engineers that have worked at a company for a number of years have an intuitive understanding of it and have never really drawn it as a map on a 2D sheet of paper or even as a 3D map if you've got a third variable that's affecting the process, okay? Engineers and operators have this sort of intuition about it that's not easily conveyed. 
what I want you to take from this is that what we're saying is essentially any point inside this region we're able to design and operate the process at. And this is why we're able to be successful with our processes because what engineers will do ahead of time is they will look at the vertex of these points. They'll likely have done simulations at these corner points and verified that operation is successful at those points in, the, in Aspen. And then the assumption is that anything interior to that will also work. Okay, now that's not always true. There could be gaps in this region. But by and large, if it works at the extremes, it also works at the interior. And what we will have somewhere here in the interior, you'll have your base case. Okay, so this is the base case that you've seen over and over in your education so far. But what I'm taking you to a better understanding of is that we need to move beyond that and, and outside of that point of operation. Okay. Now, the variables we use on these horizontal and vertical axes, they can be either controlled variables or disturbances. In this particular example, both the inlet temperature and the inlet flow were disturbances. They were not controlled variables, but they could have been um, controlled variables. So perhaps one of the last um, examples I want you to think about is, is up here, in fact. Let's just take this heat exchanger. I'm going to take this. this example and ask you to think about a heat exchanger. Yeah, for all the combinations. Yeah, you could form a multiple 2D plots. Okay. So the reason why in the assignment I'd asked you to drop out from the work to be done the need for the flow in the heat exchangers was the following. If we look at a heat exchanger, we have a process stream and you have your utility stream. And let's take a look at the idea of heating a process stream. So, oh sorry, cooling a process stream. So this is hot and this is cold. And your utility stream is cooling water. Okay, so you need some sort of cooling water flow and temperature. Now, we know what our desired cold is. So this temperature, that's desired value that we need to have in, in practice. We know what that is for downstream operation. Think of all the disturbances that will give you the worst possible operation on this. What conditions lead to you still have to successfully get to this temperature, but what is the combination of events that could make that really tough to achieve? What is the worst possible things that can happen? So quick shout out of ideas. The cooling water is hot, so high CW temperature. Okay, so this is that 40 degree Celsius day in the middle of summer. Your cooling water coming in, instead of being uh, 10 degrees Celsius now is 15, 18 degrees Celsius. Okay? So that's working against you. That's a disturbance. What else could there be that works against you? The process stream, this process stream temperature fluctuates. It's a disturbance as well, and it happens to be high. Okay? Anything else that can go wrong? Low cooling water flow. So this utility is shared amongst a variety of heat exchangers and other devices on your process. And if some other unit in your process opens the valve, the pressure drops in the entire cooling water circuit and you end up with low CW flow. Okay, so low CW flow. So there's three disturbances that you can already start to draw an operating window for. Anything else going on here? The process flow increases. So not only do you get high temperatures, but high flows. Anything else? Your exchanger is fouled. Your exchanger is fouled. Okay. So now you can start to see why 
determining what cooling water flow is is tough because it can vary and depends very much on these other conditions in the heat exchanger. Okay. So I'm going to leave that with you just as a thought. Friday we'll have Dr. Marlin and on Monday Dr. Marlin.